Saturday, August 26, 2023, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. We're going to look at ULEZ today and whether uh, ULEZ is going to plant the seeds of a revolt in the United Kingdom or England or Britain, if you want to call it that. And we're also going to do, after we look into ULEZ, I'm going to do a book review. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting, uh, this series of books, because even though they're history books, they're like uh, crime novels, really, and, and really interesting to read. So that's what we're going to do today. Rudy is okay. He, he's in the other side of the house. Uh, we had our walk today. Uh, and uh, yeah, so many people forget <laughs> that the uh, rebellion that started uh, in North America was a rebellion by Englishmen. Most, uh, most Americans at the time were Englishmen. So there is a history of the English rebelling against the higher ups. <laughs> And why is that? Well, I think it's because, and uh, this is a, a friend of mine, last week I went to visit him, and uh, we went to a really nice seaside place in Kent. We went to a pub, and then we were walking around the beach, and we were talking, and he said, uh, yeah, Mario, uh, uh, England and Britain, you know, our societies are so hierarchical and, and that's why we've always had rebellions and he's right so what I want to look at today first is the uh, Watt Tyler peasant revolt of 1381 and then we're gonna look at ULEZ if you don't know what ULEZ is if you're not in the UK don't worry I'm gonna put links in the description to stories about ULEZ and you will see what it is. But it's very controversial. It's basically the mayor of London, Greater London. It's not the mayor, uh, the Lord Mayor. This is different. The, the city of London is just a square mile. Greater London is uh, basically uh, the area around the M25. So, what Tyler? I mean, and nowadays you go around uh, Southeast London or Essex and there are many roads or streets named after Watt Tyler. So who was Watt Tyler? Uh, well, Wikipedia, I'm going to use Wikipedia, but I, I'm also going to use a, a book that I think I've recommended to talk about the Peasant Revolt of uh, 1381, Peasant's Revolt. So it says here, uh, he was born in uh, around 1320 or 24. They don't know exactly when. And uh, he died in June of 1381. He was the leader of the 30, 1381 Peasants' Revolt in England. He led a group of rebels from Canterbury to London to oppose the institution of a poll tax. And demanding and demand economic and social reforms. So, and it goes on to say here, the peasants' revolt began in May 1381, triggered by a recently imposed po tax of four pence from every adult, whether peasant or wealthy. So, ULEZ, what it's going to do from Tuesday. It's going to basically, if you don't have the right car, if you don't have a, a diesel car that's older than, uh, well, that's younger than 2015, uh, anytime you drive out of your uh, drive or your garage and you drive around the area, you're going to have to pay £12.50 for, for petrol cars and vans. If they're older, if they're from before 2006, is the same. And we knew this was coming last year, so it has impacted me because where I live, it's going to be part of the 
expansion. And uh, I had to get rid of a, a perfectly good car. <laughs> it was a diesel car that when I bought in 2010, I was told that it was good for, for the environment. We were told that diesel was better than petrol. It was more uh, fuel efficient. And now, of course, it's bad. <laughs> and I would say the same thing will happen to electric vehicles in a few years because uh, they want to make sure that you uh, own nothing and that you'll be happy, right? But anyway, let's get back to uh, what Tyler. And uh, I'm going to read what happened uh, during that revolt. Um, and, and the book is uh, Powers and Thrones, A New History of the Middle Ages by Dan Jones. I highly recommend it. And uh, if you look at what's going on here in terms of the ULAS expansion, uh, if you just do a Google search, ULAS camera vandalism, you got loads of stories. Two days ago, The Times, 90% of ULAS cameras put out of action in new air area. UK ULAS schemes pickpocket 418 million from the public. Daily Mail, 9 out of 10 ULAS cameras have been vandalized in southeast London. Evening Standard, two days ago, vandals put spy stickers <laughs> over ULAS cameras ahead of expansion. So this is pretty tame compared to what happened in 1381. So let's uh, let's get on it. Um, this is page 521 in this book. As was the case in France during the Jacquerie, the English rising of 1381 was not the preserve of the very poorest in society. Rather, it was led by what we might call the middling sorts. Not for the most part, knights or gentlemen, but village elites who occupied the roles of petty responsibility, such as constables and parish priests. The rank and file, meanwhile, were typically skilled artisans like carpenters, masons, shoemakers, skinners, and weavers. So, in the 21st century, these are people who have their own well, let's say a plumber who has a van and he's had to buy a new van if he could, if he can, or or she. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, a builder. I, I heard a story from someone who called LBC, and he said that he couldn't buy another uh, another van because he couldn't afford it because they're all uh, all the compliant vans are over twenty thousand pounds, so he had to buy like a an estate car or station wagon, as the Americans call it. And he said it bro got broken into because people can see his tools and stuff. Yeah, this is uh, the same thing here. It's all the small businesses, tradesmen. Uh, the, the thing is that Sadiq Khan, and I, I don't blame just Sadiq Khan because I think if we had another mayor, the same thing would have happened. And I recommend you watch my video with... Uh, Peter Lilly or Lord Lilly, he was one of the only five MPs who voted against the Climate Change Act of 2008. Uh, yes, <laughs> that went through right at the height of the great financial crisis. I didn't notice it. But so there's a consensus from both sides to do this. So anyway, let's keep going. The most fam famous leaders were Watt Tyler, who may well have served in France in one of the campaigns of the Hundred Years' War, and John Ball, a priest originally from Yorkshire, who was well known to the authorities, thanks to a long personal history of preaching egalitarian doctrine, which had her earned him incarceration in the Canterbury Jail for causing a public nuisance. During the Rising, Tyler operated as a de facto captain of the Kent and Essex rebels, while Ball served as the spiritual guide. In early June, Tyler, Ball, and thousands of like-minded folk marched up the Thames towards London, 
where they plan to join the, with the dissatisfied apprentices and workers in the demonstration against the incompet incompetence of Richard II's minority government. They had momentum, confidence in numbers, and no la landlord on their route dared stay in, uh, stand in their way. So here's where it gets interesting. On Wednesday, uh, 12th June, the Kent and Essex rebel, rebels were camped close to London at Blackheath. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because uh, when I met my wife, uh, we lived in Blackheath for a few years. <laughs> anyway, where a delegation of the capital's aldermen met them, bringing a message from the mayor, William Walworth, not to come any further. The message was not heeded. At Blackheath, Ball preached a famous sermon whose message was neatly summed up by the couplet. When Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentleman? <laughs> uh, this rhetorical question revealed the depth of anti-aristocratic feeling that char characterized the rebellion, as well as the conviction that Christ was on their side. The rebels re regarded the young King Richard with naive affection, seeing him as a victim of corrupt. There you go, that word corrupt. They don't use it that much anymore. A and they don't uh, call the uh, ULEZ attacks. They call it a congestion charge. Uh, yeah, they're very uh, clever in trying to avoid those kinds of words, but it is attacks. Rather than the source of tyranny himself, so yeah, uh, King Richard was very young, they claimed to stand for King Richard and the true commons. And anyone standing between king and people, either literally or metaphorically, would be considered fair game. On the morning of Thursday, 13 June, Tyler and his men moved on from Blackheath to Rotherhithe. <laughs> Nowadays, there's a tunnel there, too. Uh, there they were visited by their young hero, the king, and several of his closest counselors, who had been rowed downriver from the Tower of London on a barge. But the royal party did not dare disembark to parley with the rebels, who presented an intimidating scene on the riverbank. This reticence frustrated the mob, who proceeded to sack Southwark, London's large suburb on the south bank of the Thames, before turning on London Bridge. It ought to have been impossible to storm the city from the south, since the bridge could be barred to all crossers. Faithfully, however, rebel sympathizers within uh, the city opened the barriers and tens of thousands of rebels poured in. So began two and a half days of semi-organized mayhem, which would live long in Londoners' collective memories. Prisons were opened, legal records were seized and burned in the street. The Savoy Palace, the fine London residence belonging to the king's uncle, John of Gaunt, was stormed and burned to the ground. All hell uh, was let loose. On Friday, 14th of June, King Richard invited the rebels to send a delegation to meet him outside the city gates at Mile End. They presented him with demands for a charter that effectively stood the post-Black Death labor laws on their head. Serfdom, serfdom was uh, to be officially abolished, rents limited to four pence per acre, and labor contracts subject to regular negotiation. Richard granted all this. He also told the rebels that if they could bring any traitors to him in person, he would see that justice was done. This was a disastrous misstep, and it cost lives. When the word of the king's promise was taken back to the city, the protests which were already rough, turned murderous. Rebels forced their way into the Tower of London and seized the two most senior members of the Royal Council who were holed up there. Simon Sudbury, the Chancellor, 
and the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Sir Robert Hales, the treasurer, both were, wait for it, <laughs> beheaded and their heads put on spikes. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Am I saying this is what's going to happen? No, but it gives you an idea of how when the powers that be, and you can still call it the aristocracy, the political class, uh, people like Sadiq Khan, members of parliament, uh, civil servants, uh, they have no clue how people live and what they have to do to survive, you know, like uh, the tradesmen and uh, small businesses. And they just impose these uh, rules and regulations, these charges or taxes, and uh, they don't think. And at one point, at a certain point, people lose it. <laughs> and that's what happened in 1381. And my question is, is this going to happen in 2023 or maybe 2024? Who knows? But I don't think it's looking good. I think people are getting fed up with what's going on. And um, here's an example of how this ULES is, ULES is going to affect people tra traveling to Heathrow Airport. Uh, and this is from the Guardian a uh, newspaper who's probably a very pro ULES paper. So they, they go on and say Heathrow visitors told to beware of new charges under ULES expansion. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'll put it, I'll put a link to it in the description. I'm going to put a link as well to a, a Daily Mail article <laughs> where they show you all the ULES cameras where they are, which will probably be uh, a good thing for uh, the mayor of London. They'll probably switch them around. And I'm, I'm sure they're going to put a lot more cameras. It's going to be in every, every street, every road in this area. But one thing that I thought was interesting was this here um, about the charge. So this is going to be a 24 hour thing. It's not just because the congestion charge to go to London at a certain time at night, they don't charge you and they only start charging like at six in the morning. But this is 24 seven. Apparently the only day they won't charge is Christmas Day. But do you really want to drive around London on Christmas, Christmas Day? No, you want to be at home with your family. Uh, at least I do. But this is the one. Uh, if you're visiting the airport in a non-compliant vehicle, you will be expected to pay the charge via the TFL website or by using its phone service. I guess they want you to uh, download an app. Enter the zone at 11.30 p.m. and leave an hour later and you will have to pay for both days you were in the zone. So. Um, so let's say you have to drop someone really late at Heathrow and then you come back out and it's already the next day. So you, you will have to pay 25 pounds. It's a ripoff. And um, there are a lot of people uh, out there who we're going to have a tough time. People who have jobs as nurses or any kind of job where they have to drive to work because they don't have good public transport, buses or trains. And they can't afford to just change their cars like that. <laughs> They're supposed to give a 2,000 pound scrappage uh, thing for changing cars. But guess when they started this scheme? Well, they started it last week. <laughs> so they've given you a week uh, to try to claim this 2,000 pounds and then change your car, buy a new one. It's going to take a lot longer. You probably uh, they're probably going to finance with the with the uh, with the charges that you pay while you do all that. It's just outrageous, and I think people are getting angry. And um, some of you might say, well, you just don't pay the TFL. Yeah, that is a, an option. <laughs> and uh, earlier this year, 
I went with the uh, friend I spoke about that we were talking last week about uh, the hierarchy of uh, England. Uh, I went with him and my wife. We went to uh, a talk. It was somewhere in Kent uh, on a farm, actually. It was a nice talk. And Pierce Corbin, he showed up. <laughs> and uh, actually, I spoke to him, and uh, he said that uh, he's got like 47,000 pounds in uh, not just ULEZ because of central London, but also the congestion charge in fines. He said he'd never pays it. <laughs> he's not paid it. And they haven't done anything to him. I'm not like uh, recommending you do that. But the other thing he gave me was this, which I think is quite interesting. And I'm not going to say anything, but you can see it. There you go. He gave me this. And this, of course, has a lot, everything to do with ULES because their excuse is because we've got this here, right? So, and, and we need to save London and we need to save people. But anyway, now let's go to the book recommendations. And it's to do with England again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, for those who are probably not interested, but I am. I've been here for 31 years. And uh, yeah, these books, uh, they're great books because, and it's the same author, of course, because uh, the main character is a fictional uh, character. Uh, he's called Matthew Shardlake. He's a lawyer, but he's also a detective. And what's interesting is that within the stories, he interacts with real historical figures like Richard Rich and many others. And he's also present at real historical events like battles, wars, uh, rebellions. There was a rebellion. I think the last book is about a rebellion in uh, Norfolk. So let's start with the first, first book. Uh, it's called Dissolution. Here it is, by C.J. Sansom. And what's dissolution about? Well, it says, It is 1537, a time of revolution that sees the greatest changes in England since 1066. Henry uh, VIII has proclaimed himself supreme head of the church. The country is waking up to savage new laws, rigged trials, the country... Uh, and the greatest network of informers it has ever seen. Sounds a little bit familiar. <laughs> you know, the World Economic Forum, King Charles III, and all that. And under the orders of Thomas Cromwell, a team of commissioners is sent throughout the country to investigate the monasteries. There can be only one outcome, dissolution. So, yeah, they have dissolution. They dissolved the, the monasteries. A lot of the monks had to leave England, of course. So there you go. That's the first one. And Matthew Shardlake is in all of these. <laughs> uh, the second one is Dark Fire. Dark Fire. And what does it say here? It is 1540 and the hottest summer of the 16th century. Yes, they had hot summers back then. Uh, I wonder if they had climate change. Matthew Shardlake, believing himself out of favor with Thomas Cromwell, is busy trying to maintain his legal practice and keep a low profile. But his involvement with a, uh, with a murder case, defending a girl accused of brut brutally murdering her young cousin, brings him once again into contact with the king's chief minister, and a new assignment. So there you go. Dark fire. Uh, third one is sovereign. It's not about gold, the gold coin. <laughs> uh, anyway, autumn 1541. King Henry VIII has set out on a spectacular progress to the north to attend an extravagant submission by his rebellious subjects in York. Already in the city are lawyer Matthew Shardlake and his assistant, Jack Barrick. 
as well as legal work processing local, local petitions to the king, Shard Lake has reluctantly undertaken a special mission for Archbishop Cramner to ensure the welfare of an important but dangerous conspirator who is to be returned to London for interrogation. Uh, revelation. Spring 1543, King Henry VIII is wooing Catherine Parr, whom he wants to be, who, whom he wants for his sixth wife. Archbishop Cranmer and the embattled Protestant faction at court are watching keenly, for Lady Catherine is known to have reformist sympathies. Matthew Shardlake, meanwhile, is working on the case of a teenage boy who has been placed in the Bedlam Insane Asylum and fears that the boy's ter terrifying religious mania could lead him uh, being burnt as a heretic. Heartstone. Summer 1545. England is at war. King Henry VIII's invasion of France has gone badly wrong and a massive French fleet is preparing to sail across the Channel. As the English fleet gathers at Portsmouth, the country raises the largest militia army it has ever seen. The king has debased the currency to pay for the war, and England is in the grip of soaring inflation. <laughs> Sounds familiar, but now we're debasing the currency to pay for a, a war somewhere else, right? An economic crisis. Meanwhile, Matthew Shardlake is given an intriguing uh, legal case by an old servant of Queen Catherine Parr, which will lead him to the corrupt labyrinth of the King's Court of Wards. Asked to investigate claims of monstrous wrongs committed against his young ward, Hugh Curtis, by Sir Nicholas Hobby, a Hampshire landowner, which have already involved one mysterious death, Shardlake and his assistant, Barrick, journey to Portsmouth. Shardlake has taken the case despite the imminent threat of invasion, as it also gives him the opportunity to investigate the mysterious past of Ellen Fetty Place, a woman incarcerated in the Bedlam whom he has befriended and whose family once lived nearby. I put my glasses back on. It was tough to read that one. So uh, this is what the uh, one, two, three, four, five. This is the six uh, in the series. There's seven. Lamentation. So let's see what they say here. Summer 1546. King Henry VIII is slowly, painfully dying. His Protestant and Catholic counselors are engaged in a final and restricted, decisive power struggle. Whoever wins will control the government of Henry's successor, eight year old Prince Edward. As heretics, are hunted across London and the radical Protestant and Askew is burned at the stake. The Catholic uh, party focus uh, their attack on Henry's sixth wife, Matthew Shardlake's old mentor, Queen Catherine Parr. Shardlake, still haunted by events aboard uh, the warship Mary Rose the year before, is working on the Quarterstoke Will case, a savage dispute between rival siblings. Then unexpectedly, he is summoned to Whitehall Palace and asked for help by his old patron, the now beleaguered and desperate queen. So there you go. Okay, <laughs> this is the last one. It's called Tombland. Summer 1549. Two years after the death of Henry VIII, England is sliding into chaos. The nominal king, Edward VI, is 11 years old. His uncle, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, rules as protector. 
the extirpation of the old religion by radical Protestants is stirring discontent among the populace, while the protector's prolonged war with Scotland is proving a disastrous failure and threatens to involve France. Worst of all, the economy is in collapse, <laughs> inflation rages, and rebellion is stirring among the peasantry. Since the old king's death, Matthew Shardlake has been working as a lawyer in the service of Henry's young, younger daughter, the Lady Elizabeth. The gruesome murder of Edith Boleyn, the wife of John Boleyn, a, distance, a distant Norfolk relation of Elizabeth's mother, which could have political implications for Elizabeth, brings Shardlake and assistant Nicholas Overton to the summer assizes at Norwich. There they are reunited with Shardlake's foremost assistant, Jack Barrick. The three find layers of mystery and danger surrounding Edith's death as a second murder is committed. And then East Anglia explodes. <laughs> a peasant rebellion breaks out across the country. The yeoman Robert Kett leads a force of thousands in overthrowing the landlords and establishing a vast camp outside Norwich. Soon the rebels have taken over the city, England's second largest. Barrack throws in his lot with the rebels. Nicholas, opposed to them, becomes a prisoner in Norwich Castle, while Shardlake has to decide where his ultimate loyalties lie. So there you go. Uh, that's the uh, Shardlake series. Highly recommend it. You don't have to buy them all at, at once. You can start with Dissolution, and then if you enjoy it, you buy the second one. And... Um, yeah, the, the author is uh, C.J. Sensum. Yes, this has gone on for a long time, uh, but here in the UK, we have a, a long weekend. Uh, Monday is uh, a bank holiday. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, that's what they call holidays in the UK, bank holidays. Don't think the banks are going under or anything at the moment. So, and with that, I'm going to wish... Uh, Wish you, wherever you are in the world, a very good day and a very good weekend. Take care. Bye.